All right, I'm so glad you're here uh, at Every Day Star Campus. I want to give a shout out to Hartsoul and Madison, and especially everybody that's joining us online. Maybe you're on vacation, but maybe you haven't yet come into the building to worship with us, and you're kind of checking things out, and, and I want to just welcome you and let you know we would love, love, love for you to be in the building today. Everybody clap your hands to welcome Daystar online. Come check us out. Come be with us. Hey, that, I just wanted to just one quick uh, note about the vision behind the movie night. It's, it's a fun family activity, and, and that's really good. But really, the main focus is that you bring someone, okay? Because there are a lot of people, maybe that you know, that are not ready to go to church. They're not, they're not, they don't feel like they're church folks. Maybe they have some questions about us. They're, they're not sure about us. And this is a great way to introduce them to your church, your faith family. They will love it, and they'll have a good time. So Put that on your radar. Who am I going to invite? If you go to school, invite your school friends, invite your neighbors, all that kind of stuff. Hey, I've had a great time so far talking about liar, lunatic, or Lord, this C.S. Lewis quote, which one is Jesus, the liar, the lunatic, or Lord? Let me kind of tell you where we are so far because this is week three, all right? And in the first week, we found that Jesus is Lord because of evidence of divinity, like we, we saw that, and uh, I won't go back into that, but if you missed that, it's on YouTube. You should go back and watch it, share it uh, online. Second, this was last week, we talked about miracles, and that Jesus did all these amazing miracles, and he's still doing miracles. Uh, hey, let me tell you something that's really cool. I got, uh, there, there was actually a miracle that took place while I was preaching about miracles last week at Daystar. Can I tell you about that miracle? Y'all ready? This is so cool. All right, so this is from Chad Barker. Chad goes to the Hartzell campus, and he sent this to Pastor Andrew, and uh, so I just want to read it to you. He says, um, it was Sunday, the 15th of September, that's last Sunday, Pastor Jerry was giving the sermon, liar, lunatic, or Lord, uh, and he said, I was in a jet ski accident back on Labor Day on the Tennessee River. I had severe chest pain, back pain from the accident, in fact, it was bad enough that Sunday that I was planning on going back to the ER to be checked again after church. While pastor was talking about healing, I, I just had a very strange feeling come over me. I honestly didn't know what it was. It took a moment for me to realize what had happened. I sat there and noticed that I could breathe without pain. Uh, I even noticed that my ribs uh, were not in pain. I started to move around in my chair and there was no, no pain in my back or in my hip. My wife looked at me uh, like, why are you giggling, uh, wiggling all over this place? I was in complete shock. The funny thing is I didn't even realize that what, what had happened. I'm embarrassed to say that I didn't even know that God had just healed me. My wife and I went forward uh, for prayer at the end of service, and we were prayed for by Jason Knighton, whose prayer drove it home that, we had, that I had just been healed. My family and I went to lunch afterwards. We went shopping, and this is something I couldn't do without severe pain before this. I can say that I was able to do this now with no pain, and I want to give all the glory to God and state that his hand touched me. I know I've been healed. Thank you, Jesus. How about that? Man, we celebrate that. And right after the early service, I'm in the lobby, and I meet a, a lady who, who says, uh, like, she's just like she is smiling, her whole face is smiling. She said, I can't wait to, uh, I've been uh, giddy all week long to tell you that my husband came up for prayer last Sunday. He had four, uh, stage four cancer. She told the name of the cancer I never heard of. She said it's one of the most aggressive kinds of cancer. He has not had any treatments yet. They were trying to line him up for all kinds of treatments, but they've been delay after delay. The doctor wanted to do another PET scan to see just how fast that this cancer had been growing without any treatment. And he called her back, them back, and said, I can't believe this. It's not been going forward. It's been shrinking. She said, several places are gone, and other places are already beginning to shrink. I think we ought to give God praise for that. That's, that's awesome. She actually recorded the doctor's voice because he was so shocked at what was going on. And I just want to tell you, we, we believe Jesus still does miracles. That Jesus could do a miracle in your life today. Somebody say amen. amen. 
the end of service, we'll have prayer. Would love to come and pray with you. Okay. All right. So these are the first two weeks. Today, we're going to talk about how that Jesus is Lord because he taught what no one else taught. His, his teachings were absolutely amazing. Now, listen, we're going to cover a lot of Bible today. I'm going to start with the greatest sermon that's ever been preached, okay? And that's not my sermon. That's Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. It's in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. I'm not going to read all that, but then we're going to go to what Jesus did right after the Sermon on the Mount, and, and he did a miracle of forgiveness. The most amazing, a woman was caught in the act of adultery, and he, he, he physically saved her life, and then he spiritually saved her soul. But it's all a part of, of, of the context of the narrative. Now, one of the problems with modern believers is understanding the Bible in its context. Uh, theologians call it contextualization. Uh, it's a big word that means that, that when you pick up the Bible and you read it, you immediately read it in an American, English, 21st century context. And that is nothing like it was written in. Okay, it was not written in English. It was not written in America. There was no America at the time. It wasn't uh, modern. It was, you know, centuries ago, uh, 2,000 years ago, and, and, and a different language. Much of that language is even dead today. So understanding the context is so important. I'm going to try to provide a little bit of that for you today. Take your Bible and open with me to Matthew chapter 5. And if you don't have a Bible, uh, maybe you've got the Bible app with you. And I'm going to start with what's called the Beatitudes, Okay. And, and in Matthew 5, this is where the Sermon on the Mount begins, verse 3. Now, what you're going to see here is Jesus with a whole new line of teaching that no one, see, that, that culture in Jesus' day was all about self-promotion. It's about, you know, it's, it's kind of like politics today, telling you how amazing they are, how awesome they are, how they're going to fix everything, and deep in your heart, you know, they're full of, mm. Okay, um, but, but this is the way the world was in those days. Like you just, it was all about might makes right. It's about strength. It's about authority. Anyone that was poor, anyone that was sick, anyone that was, uh, you know, taken advantage of, they, they were, pr th th that was proof that God was not for them or proof that they were in sin or proof that they deserved what they got. And that's the context Jesus says these things into. Okay, so we'll start in verse three. He said, Blessed are those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. No one would ever say the poor is blessed, but Jesus did. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Verse 5, blessed are those who are humble, for they will inherit the earth. Nobody believed in humility in those days. It's all about honor, strength, authority. He says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Nobody believed in mercy. It's about take control. You exercise your authority. And Jesus is flipping the script on the whole world. He says, blessed are those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. Blessed are those who work for peace, for they'll be called the children of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted for doing what is right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. See, previous to that, they've been saying, if you're persecuted, it's because you're sinful. It's because you're weak. It's because you deserve it. And Jesus said, no, you're blessed when you're persecuted. He goes on and says, blessed are you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. By the way, that does translate right into our world today. Have you noticed when you stand up for Jesus, people say all kind of awful things about you in our culture today? Jesus said that, that that's a blessing, actually. And then in verse 12, he says, be happy about it. Be glad for a great reward awaits you in heaven. Now, he goes on, and in verse 14, this is where I want to lean in today. He says, you are the light of the world. You are a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. And in the same way, let your light shine for all men to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. How many of you have ever heard that verse, let your light shine, right? You know about that, let your light shine. A little funny fact about this verse, when our church had just really started taking off, you know, we started with less than 100 people and we were in a converted Piggly Wiggly store down in Dodge City and uh, there was like 600, it had grown to like six, 700 people. We had one acre of property, 
53, I think, parking spots, you know. And on the biggest day, we had like 1,000 people on, on our biggest day. We were averaging six or 700 people. We were having five weekend services. People's cars are getting towed all over the community. Like we had to have somewhere else to go. And so we started raising money. We started praying. And I started looking for property. And I drove all over everywhere around Coleman County just trying to find a spot. And then I drove here like to this Where I'm standing right now, there was nothing here, just open land. It was a lot taller than it is right now because we had to cut all this down. I had to put my truck into four-wheel drive because I have a four-wheel drive because, you know, road tired. Um, (laughs) So I drove my truck all the way up to the top, and, and, man, I just started blaring the worship music. And I threw the doors open, and, man, I just started seeking guys like God. And I could really see so much of the community from up on this hill. If you're at, uh, not at the Coleman campus, maybe you've never been, it's a really high spot, and you can see all over. And, again, it was probably another 20, maybe 30 feet taller than where we are right now. And I'm just seeing everything, and I'm just praying, and I'm talking to God. And, and God dropped that verse in my spirit while I was praying. Have you ever done that? You've been in prayer or worship, and a Bible verse just comes to your heart right then. It's like a right now word. And he says, you're, a, you're the light of the world. And I was like, yes, that's what this church is going to be. It's going to be the light in all these dark places, broken families, add addictions. We're, we're going to be the light. And he said, you're going to be a city on a hill. And I was like, yes, we're going to shine on top of a hill. And, but God, speak to me, where? Where do you want us to go? And he's like, a city on a hill. He just kept saying that. And I was like, yes, we're going to be a city on a hill. Now, where are we going to build this church building, God? He's like, a city, like on a hill, Jerry, a hill. And I was like, oh, a hill. <laughs> like this hill right here. And then so we bought this property, okay. And we had just a couple miracles financially to make it even possible. Uh, but th- for, for our church, it's physically a city on a hill as well as figuratively a city on a hill. And Jesus drops that teaching into regular folks and says, you're going to be a light in dark places. You, 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 you're going to be a, a change agent wherever you are. Now, that's Matthew 5, 6, and 7, Sermon on the Mount. You should go read that whole thing. The very next chapter, Matthew 8, a woman is caught in the act of adultery, and she's put in the darkest place in her life. They are accusing her. They're humiliating her. She's embarrassed. They even want to kill her. And then Jesus says this in John 8. He spoke to the people and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you don't have to walk in darkness because you'll have the light that leads to life. There's an amazing contrast. You know, if you just pick up the Bible and find your favorite Bible verse and talk about that, you're going to miss all the context of the story. You know, I'm trying to give you four chapters to help you understand this context. There's an amazing contrast where Jesus says, listen, you're supposed to be the light of the world. Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Then we find the darkest place in this woman's life, Matthew 8. And then the next thing Jesus does, he says, hey, I'm the light of the world. I want to walk you through Matthew 8 today. And I want to show you, uh, there's really three things that are happening right there. You have the law, the love, and the light. The light's important. How many of you, when you were kids, you were kind of afraid of the dark at night when you went to bed and they turned out all the lights and you're in the bedroom by yourself? Come on, anybody? You were, you're afraid of the dark? A bunch of liars in here. Just, <laughs> what's wrong with y'all? I know you're afraid of the dark. I, I thought there was monsters under the bed. For you, was it in the bed or were they under the bed or in the closet? Somebody said closet, in the closet. And, and as long as you got a nightlight on and the closet door shut, you're fine, Right? The monsters could eat you, but they're not strong enough to open the closet door. So you're going to be fine, right? A little bit of light, though, changes everything. My kids always wanted the light in the room. And, and so we're going, to, we're going to walk through this story where Jesus says he's the light. All right, here's the first reality you need to know. That the law, the Old Testament law, the, the, the right and wrong part of the Bible reveals our what? Guilt. That we are all guilty. Now, here's the woman, and here's her story. In John 8 and 2, early the next morning, Jesus was back at the temple. A crowd soon gathered. He sat down and he taught them. And as he was speaking, as he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd, right right in the middle of the temple. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. This has to be the darkest moment of her life, okay? 
it, it's got to be the most devastating moment. She's embarrassed. She's, somehow she's been caught. I, I don't know what these guys are doing. I don't know what the, how, they're, how they caught her. What are they, what, were they peeking? I, I don't know what's going on. It's pretty creepy. But first thing we notice is, where's the guy? What, what about that guy? How come we're not dragging him out there? How come we're not going to stone him? You know, he gets off somehow, and they're going to drag this woman in here. Now, if they caught her in the act and they drug her in there, we don't know what she's wearing, if she's wearing anything or if she's trying to cover up. She's been brought in the temple. You can't imagine a more humiliating, shame-filled, embarrassing, dark moment. She's facing death because, verse 5, they say this woman should be stoned. Verse 6 says, they test Jesus and say, what do you say? The law of Moses says she should be stoned. What do you say? See, they're trying to get Jesus stuck here. They're trying to catch him in some kind of, you know, uh, religious uh, mistake. Because if he says, yes, the law of Moses says stone her, we should stone her. Then they're going to say, see, you never were about love and acceptance like all that teaching. But if, on the other hand, he says, no, we're going to love and accept her, then they're going to say, well, you don't believe in the law of Moses. And so they, they're, trying to, they're trying to catch Jesus. Now, let me drive home this point. The law reveals our guilt. Let me make sure we understand. We are guilty people by our own sin. You're guilty. Let me just tell you, you're guilty. I'm guilty. And, and, and we don't like that. People do not like to hear that today. You know, I just made some choices and, you know, I had the right intentions and, you know, I, I've, got, I've really got a good heart. You know what the Bible says about your heart? It says the heart is the most deceptive thing and can't be trusted. That's what the Bible says about my heart and your heart. Well, I got a good heart. No, you don't. <laughs> you really don't. The Bible says we don't have a good heart. Let me just do a little quick test, a little three question test. You got to be honest right here. Everyone here who has ever told a lie. I need you to raise your hand. You ever told a lie? Okay. So if your hand's not in the air, you're currently lying. That's fine. It's all of us. We've all lied. Some more than others. Okay. How many of you have ever stolen anything? You ever stolen anything? I remember stealing stuff when I was a little kid. You know, you got a little matchbox car. I want it. Now I've got one. Okay. So we've stolen. We've lied. Here's a tougher one. And you don't have to, like this one, you don't have to do like this. Like early service, I got some little... You ever had an impure thought and you thought impure thoughts? You just you know. <laughs> saw, saw some men and was like, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll make it easy on you. We all have, okay? We all have, okay? So if you lie, that means you're a liar. There you go. If you steal, that makes you a thief. And Jesus said, if you think lustful thoughts, he says, you've already committed adultery in your heart. So, so what we all just realized is you're a bunch of lying, thieving adulterers. <laughs> Welcome to Daystar, the feel-good church. That's all we do. We make everybody feel good. No, that, that drives home the point that without Jesus, we are hopelessly living in darkness. And why is it so important for me to drive home this point? Well, it's this. Unless we see ourselves as sinners, we'll never realize how badly we need a Savior. Let me say that again. Until you see yourself as a sinner, you don't know how bad you need a Savior. And that's the problem with the modern world today. We feel like we come to church because we prove how righteous we are. We come to church to get a little bit better. We're already really good. We come to church to knock off the rough edges. No, I am here today because the Apostle Paul said it best. He said, I preach this gospel so that, and I keep humbling myself before God because I may, while I'm preaching this, be disqualified from heaven myself. That's what the Apostle Paul wrote, who wrote 13 books of the New Testament. Let me tell you something. I, if I stand on my own righteousness, I fall desperately short, and I have no way into the kingdom of God. And, and we have to start right there. The law reveals our guilt. But the good news is the love reveals God's grace. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. And you can start seeing that here. They said, this woman should be uh, stoned to death. Jesus, what do you say? And in verse 6, Jesus stooped down and he wrote in the dust with his finger. That's a famous moment. And people always want to know, what did he write? Have you ever wondered that? What did he write? You know, they ask him a question. He stoops down. and The Bible never tells us what he wrote. Now, the very first time I read that, years ago, I thought, he's writing down their sins. I think he's writing down what those suckers did because they're just as miserable sinners as she was. 
And then I went to Bible college and I learned about it. I went to seminary and I studied about it. And you know what I believe now? I think he was writing their sins down. <laughs> Three reasons why. Number one, I learned that there are some later manuscripts that actually say as much. They, they, they hint in the writing that that's what he did. I also learned that this word here that says wrote, there, there's two Greek words that could be used to translate wrote, but the one that is used here means to write a list of accusations, to write a record of something down. So he, he's writing something down. That's the second reason. The third reason I think that's what Jesus was doing is because that'd just be so cool if that's what he was doing. <laughs> what, wouldn't it be great? He's just writing down what they did. So I, I think that's what he's doing. And in verse six, they kept demanding an answer. So he stood up again and he said this famous line. This is why he's the Lord. He says what no one else has ever said. He says, okay, let him who has never sinned throw the first stone. That's a pretty inclusive statement right there. Everybody who has never sinned is allowed to judge someone else. That pretty much excludes us all. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. Nobody here is in a position to judge someone else's sin. How do I know that? Well, you just, you're just preaching easy salvation. You're trying to get a big crowd of people in your church. You're just trying to make it easy on the sinners. No, I'm just reading what Jesus Christ himself said. Whoever is without sin is uh, worthy of casting uh, judgment over someone else. So guess who that is? That's the one and only Jesus. He's the only righteous judge. And if I could teach anything to the entire body of Christ, it would be this. You are not here to judge somebody. You're not here to judge how they live. You're not here to judge how they dress. You're not here to judge how they vote. You're not here to judge what they think is right and wrong. We are meant to be representatives of the love and compassion of Jesus Christ. He's the only one righteous to judge, and you can trust him. Why you got to judge? Don't you trust that God is able to judge and to separate the sheep from the goats? I'm, I'm going to do my job, which is to love people. The Bible says it is through kindness that people are drawn to repentance. Come on, give God praise for being the only righteous judge. Amen and amen. So they keep on and on and on. They want to find something wrong with her. And, and here's the reality of human condition. Here's what we like to do. We like to judge others by their actions, but we judge ourselves by our intentions. You did it. You said it. I saw it. I know what you said. Don't try to change it back. I know what you said. You're a sinner. You're terrible. You're mean. You're awful. Well, what about what you did? Well, what I meant to do was, what I actually thought was, what, what, what I, my, my heart said, you see, and that's why you're not qualified to be anybody judge because you can't read their heart. You, I can't read your heart. I couldn't judge you. I'd never judge you. I can't understand the intentions of your heart. And so Jesus stoops down, he writes on the ground, he stands up, he says, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. And then he does this, which is pretty cool. He stoops down again and he wrote in the dust. Now, here's what I think went down, okay? This is just my opinion, okay? There's, the Bible doesn't say it happened this way, it doesn't say it didn't. Scholars have wondered and debated. I think the first time he squatted down, he started writing the name of the women these suckers had been, you know, messing with. So he writes... You know, he writes like Mary. He writes like Laura because, you know, Stephen over here been shimmy sham with Laura, you know. And, um, and then he writes Lucy over here because old Bob and Lucy been, you know, getting around. And so he writes all this down. And, and they're all like, whatever, you know, no big deal. But he goes and does it again. So this time, I, here's what I, again, doesn't say it in the Bible. This is what I think happened. I think he takes uh, like... Mary's name, and he circles it, and he draws a line over here to John with an arrow. And John's like, <laughs> and he circles Lucy over here and draws a line over here to Stephen. And y'all know that Homer Simpson meme where he just slides back into the hedges? <laughs> They're like, <laughs> it says, when they heard this, they slipped away <laughs> one by one, beginning with the oldest. The, that oldest guy's like, hey, Bob, you get this, and I'm going to stone the next one. You, you go ahead. <laughs> I'm going to get out of here. He's smart, right? <laughs> Until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. You have the most broken moment of her life. And who's with her? The Savior of the world. What an image. Religion has got it so wrong, y'all. Religion is like big, beautiful buildings and stained glass. And there's nothing wrong with that, okay? I'm not, I'm not against those things. Stained glass windows and a big cross over the door and like 
clean it up, get your Sunday best on, look your best, smile, square your shoulders, sing the hymns and all. But the true Jesus is down here in the dirt with this woman in her darkest moment and he's running off all the religious people to get right in her face and say, you matter. You're bigger than this. You're better than this moment. And that's who we've got to be. He, he says, I'm the light of the world, right? You, you understand that? He says, I'm the light. But, but he's already said, you all are the light of the world. <laughs> and so after they walked away, he stood up and he said, where are your accusers? Does not anyone condemn you? And she said, no, Lord. And he said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. One minute, put yourself in her shoes, one minute, she's dragged out half naked, embarrassed, about to be murdered by these religious angry zealots. And the next minute, Jesus, just with a few words, has run them off. And the only person righteous enough to judge you says, you are not judged. You are forgiven. I don't know about you, but when I know Jesus has accepted me, I don't care what anybody else thinks about me. When I know I've got my place in heaven because of his blood and because I've received it, it really doesn't matter what my approval rating is in this world. Can I hear an amen to that? Amen. This is where this woman is. She said that, he said, there's no one left to condemn you. And what Jesus said to her that day is what he's saying to you this day. You are not defined by your worst moment. The darkness you're walking in right now does not have to be your forever assignment. You're bigger than that. That mistake is not the end of your story. It's just, it's just a chapter. It's just one part of it. And you won't be defined by it. Th those religious people claim to be the descendants of David and Old Testament scholars. But somehow they missed when David in the Old Testament said this about Jesus. He's prophesying about the future. He says, Jesus has removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. I, I, that, that's beyond comprehension. That's where your sin is. When you come to Jesus, your sin is as far away from you as you could possibly comprehend. And see, that's the part these men could never understand. They say you got to pay for your sins. you got to make amends for your sins. you got to make things right. But Jesus is not some ordinary teacher like the religious leaders of the day. Jesus steps in and he says, no, that's not how we do this. That's not how I'm going to treat you. And that's when he said, I'm the light of the world. If you follow me, you don't have to walk in darkness. You will have the light that leads to life. You don't have to stay in that dark place. You don't have to be the sum total of the things that you've done. Somehow religion still gets it wrong today, still wants to judge and hate people, but that light, here's the last point, that light reveals our hope. Our hope is not in what we've been able to do. Okay, again, get this sequence. In Matthew 5, he says, you're the light of the world. You're a city on a hill. You can't be hidden. Matthew 8, we find this woman, and instead of them being bringing light to a dark place, they drag her up. They want to kill her, and then Jesus saves her and says, I'm the light of the world. You don't have to walk in darkness. And that's the key the Pharisees couldn't understand. They had a head knowledge of all the scriptures. They did everything perfectly right according to the law, but it only went into their heads, and it made them judgmental of everyone who didn't do it just the way they thought they should. It's got to come into your heart. They knew the truth from their heads, but they didn't know it from their hearts. And that's just like modern religion that hates sinners. They hate gay people. They hate transgender people. We get all upset about that, like, like, like there's some attack on us and it's going to somehow take away your salvation or something. We hate people that don't vote like us. We get so angry about how people are going to vote. and We, we forget that our God's assignment is to be the hope of the world. God's assignment is to be the omnipotent, omnipresent, all-powerful, all-capable God. This whole world could be thrown to hell in a handbasket. The whole world could be turned upside down. God's still going to be on the throne. Jesus is still going to be Jesus. My job's to be his. Listen, I'm going to go up in that voting booth and I'm going to be like, mm, mm, mm. I'm going to throw, take that. But I get one vote and some knucklehead's going to cancel out my vote somewhere else. Just deal with it. 
But man, I've got a Savior who transcends politics and time and race and religion and everything man has made to control people and to do things his own way. He's the light of the world and in every dark place you can trust him. So what's that mean for you? Like literally in my notes right here it says, so what? So what? what? So what? So what now? What does that mean for my own life? What that means is that Jesus sees you today through the eyes of a Savior and not a judge. Religious people are so judgmental. And they're the ones that are not worthy to judge anybody according to the words of Jesus. The only one who is worthy is Jesus. And today, he has chosen not to judge you. He's chosen to save you. Now, the Bible is very clear. There is coming a day of judgment for sure. But the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Right now, you may be surrounded by darkness, like anxiety and fear and depression, or you could be surrounded by a darkness that you've sought out by sin and addiction and, and, and bad mistakes. But the light of Jesus drives all that out. There's nowhere in the world where darkness can overcome light. Do you know that? You can be completely dark and all you have is one match and you light it, the darkness starts to go away. That's why Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. He wants you to know that, that he is what you need. 